this episode of Shaping the Future, we discuss the abrupt cooling of the Arctic in the late summer months that is preventing the widely anticipated further collapse of summer sea ice, whilst intensifying heat waves at lower latitudes. This new hypothesis was recently published by Professor Jennifer Francis from the Woodwell Climate Research Centre in Falmouth, Massachusetts, and Dr Wu from the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and Institute of Atmospheric Sciences at Fudan University in Shanghai. It is not often that anyone ever mentions negative feedback mechanisms when it comes to sea ice, but this is exactly what is being suggested. Jennifer Francis has also been involved in research that links sea ice loss to changes in jet stream patterns that impact our weather in the Northern Hemisphere, and this work further unpicks the complexity of how the Arctic climate system interacts with the rest of the world. Thank you for listening to this podcast. In the next episode, I'll be speaking with Dr. Saima Wazed, who is the thematic ambassador for the Climate Vulnerable Forum representing Bangladesh. Dr. Wazed discusses how extreme climate events can render people immediately vulnerable from a mental health perspective as they struggle to come to terms with the losses that these incur, from livelihoods to suffering loss of loved ones or both. A link to Dr. Wu's and Francis's paper is provided in the notes below. Jennifer, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me today. My pleasure, Nick. The discussion around summer sea ice, and especially the minimum and the potential for a nice free summer in the Arctic, is a hotbed of debate. Can you describe what you were setting out to look for in this recent research of yours? Right. So it's been an interesting uh, decade, really. The last time we broke the record for the least amount of sea ice uh, during the summer in the Arctic was back in 2012. So, you know, that's quite a few years ago now. And it seemed like every winter and spring, we were potentially headed towards a new record. Sea ice amounts were running at record low levels for that time of year. And so we were kind of on the edges of our seats wondering, oh, is this gonna be the summer that either goes ice free or at least breaks the record again? And almost every year since then, we've seen this really curious, kind of abrupt halt in the reduction of the ice or the rate of its loss. And so Dr. Bingyi Wu and I had written a paper last year that looked at these different circulation patterns or wind patterns that were occurring over the Arctic and relating those to things like heat waves happening during the summer over Asia. So what we noticed was that one of these large-scale wind patterns was occurring much more frequently in the last decade or so. And it was related to conditions in the Arctic that really were causing the ice to stop decreasing during late August and early September and preventing a new record from occurring. But interestingly, we also found that this pattern was also associated with an increase in frequency of heat waves in various parts of the Northern Hemisphere during the summer. So it was just a, a very interaction uh, between this thing that we're seeing happening in the Arctic where um, the ice loss all of a sudden kind of stops in late August, early September, and also connected with this increase in heat waves, which, which of course has been really disruptive to many areas in recent summers, these very severe and persistent heat waves. Did you find anything that actually links these two together in terms of some sort of mechanism? Well, we have a hypothesis. Um, okay. It's going to be difficult to prove, but what we think is happening is that we know that the spring snow cover in high latitude land areas, so along the northern tier of Asia and in northern North America, that snow cover has been disappearing rapidly during May-June time frame. And what that does is it allows the soil underneath the snow to be exposed to the spring, strong spring sunshine much earlier. It dries the soil out much earlier and allows it to heat up much sooner. And what that does is it, it sets up um, a pattern of temperatures from north to south that create kind of a double peak. So if you were, say, walking from Texas in North America and you started walking north, you'd expect the temperatures to go down, which is what they would normally do. Mm -hmm. But because of this loss of snow in the far north part of the continent, 
you'd run into this area where the temperatures were much warmer than normal. And so you end up with, you start kind of going down a temperature hill and then up a temperature hill and then down again. And this pattern is the fingerprint really of some other research that's been done recently by people at, at the Potsdam University and also Michael Mann at Pennsylvania State University where they've identified this fingerprint of temperatures like that and associated it with, with extreme summer weather conditions because that double peak in temperature tends to create a split in the jet stream. And when you get one of these splits in the jet stream, it tends to track the weather patterns that are between those two branches of the jet stream and make them very persistent. And they've, they've connected this with the occurrence of heat waves and summer flooding events and other types of extreme weather during the summer. So what we found was a pattern that looked very similar to this. And we think that it's all tied back to the loss of that spring snow cover. But you know, to prove that, it's going to require some uh, pretty in-depth drilling experiments, okay. and hopefully, we'll be able to do that. Okay. In terms of that loss of the snow cover, this is just to be clear that this is from the overall global warming forcing, which is sort of the anthropogenic. Yes, there's no other explanation for it. And is that yes. because it's quite complex in as in as much as we don't often hear about negative feedbacks in the Arctic, especially talking about ice, but this kind of is. And, but how stable is it in terms of a feedback, given that it might be good that we're seeing a slow of the ice loss, but at the same time, we're seeing that intensification of heat over the lower latitude. Is that something you think is, is just going to stay or get more intense or get overridden by something else? Well, I think overall, the, the warming of the globe because of all the extra heat trapping gases that we put into the atmosphere is going to win. We are going to see the ice continue to decline. But there will be summers like we've seen in the last decade or so where all of a sudden the, you know, what looks like might be a new record maybe won't happen because of this, this pattern that um, is, you know, part of, part of the fluctuations that occur in the atmosphere, but we're just seeing this particular one occurring more often. The last two summers, for example, where we came very close to breaking the new record, this pattern that we've identified that does contribute to this negative feedback was not in place. And so it's still consistent when this pattern is in its you know, opposite phase to the one that cools the Arctic. Um, we see the ice retreat very far. And so um, I think you know, at some point we are going to see this ice free Arctic probably within the next decade or two. One of the things that quite often people say, well, you know, we get natural variability, but this is different to that because it's actually a mechanism that's abruptly changing the weather regime in the summer months or late summer months. Is that correct? Well, if our hypothesis is correct in, in that it's tied to the loss of snow cover, then yes, this is definitely um, another facet of the impacts of climate change on the global circulation patterns. And, you know, sometimes it looks like natural variability, but this has been a very unusual behavior that we've, and uh, a big shift in just the last decade. So it does appear to be another influence of global warming and climate change. Okay, and what next for your research then? What's the next stage in, are you going to be trying to prove this out some more? Well, we would like to be able to do that. Um, it's going to require, as I said, some pretty intensive modeling experiments. And hopefully with my colleagues, including Dr. Wu, we'll be able to do some of that. So we'll, we'll be heading in that direction for sure. Okay, well, thank you very much for speaking to me because it's complex but really interesting yeah nothing is simple about the climate system <laughs>